Today, we are continuing in a series of messages that I've called Better Than Before. The idea of this series came from hearing so many people over the last year say, I just can't wait until things get back to normal, you know, like they were before COVID. I get that. I really do. But I have a greater hope than that. I would love for things to be better than they were before. I want to emerge from this season better than I was before. And I want you to emerge from this season better than you were before. We've been talking about some intentional questions that we can ask and steps that we can take to intentionally design the way forward. And today, I want to talk about trust. Have you ever done what's called a trust fall? It's where a group of people will stand behind someone who's facing away from the group. The person facing away will begin to fall backwards, trusting that the people in the group behind them will catch them before they hit the ground. Trust falls are found on playgrounds and even in the corporate world. They're often used to build camaraderie among team members and to build trust. Will you trust them enough that they will not let your head and body hit the ground? Can they be trusted with something that important to you? People are one thing, but I have a slight twist on this. Can we really trust God? Is He trustworthy? Now, if you've been in church a while, you might want to pop out with the church answer. Yes, of course. He can. Here's what I know, though. Trust manifests itself in tangible ways. And today, I want us to explore this question as we intentionally design our way forward into our lives individually and into a church that is better than before. I'm going to invite you to power on or turn in your Bible to the book of Luke, Luke's biography of Jesus, chapter 12. Now, if you're here, you're watching, and you're not a church person, you would not call yourself a follower of Jesus, I want you to know that we're really glad that you're here. God brought you here on purpose, for a purpose. My hope today is that you will begin to see a glimpse of what the church can be about when it's working right, when it's working the way that Jesus designed it to work. Luke chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, that's Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Families fighting over inheritance is nothing new. Rabbis were often the ones that would settle disputes. They would bring these disputes to the rabbis so they could be settled. Rabbis were well-educated. They were well-respected. And so this guy in the crowd sees Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher, and brings him a dispute. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? That's not exactly the response the guy was looking for. Then he said to him, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, Jesus says. There are different types. Jesus is concerned with the attitude here of the people involved, not over who gets what. The famous business tycoon John D. Rockefeller once was asked, Sir, you you have a lot of money. How much is enough? And his response just a little bit more. That's what Jesus is addressing here. And Jesus told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, greed is the assumption that everything that's placed in my hands is for me. It's a dangerous assumption. And the followers of Jesus will recall something that we've talked about many times. No matter if we're talking about your health, Your energy, your time, your money, your gifts, your mind, your work, everything that is put in your hands is not just for you, is it? 
It's for the benefit of those around you. Now, this guy in Jesus' story doesn't get that. He wants to enjoy everything for himself. If you go back and you look in this passage, count the number of times you see I, me, or mine. Again and again and again. I mean, this sounds like the guy from the old commercial. You know, he made his money the old-fashioned way. He earned it. And he deserved, he thought, to keep it and enjoy it all himself. People in this day, when Jesus is talking, saw bountiful crops and finances in excess of your needs as blessings from God. So this guy would have seen, been seen by all of Jesus' listeners as a very blessed man. And they would have been nodding their head. Yeah, yeah, he's worked hard. Yeah, now he can take life easy. Yeah, I hope I can do that one day too, Jesus. But then Jesus continues the story. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Now, this was not the response anyone listening to Jesus would have expected. God calls him a fool, but he's been blessed. Look at all of his stuff. He has so much stuff. See, this is someone who is blind to judging the right priorities in life. That's what he means by a fool. That's somebody who rejects God's knowledge and his principles for living. Wait, I, I thought he was blessed by God. I thought that's what all the stuff signified. Are you saying all that wasn't a sign of God's pleasure with him? Are you saying that all that stuff wasn't a sign of God's blessing for what he did? See, they saw it as cause and effect. If I do the right things, God will like me and he will bless me. And if I don't do the right things or I don't do enough of the right things, well, God won't like me and he won't bless me. It's an old idea. And sadly, one that's still around today in our day. Jesus is teaching them something new. He says, this is how it will be. With whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Greed is the assumption that everything that is placed in my hands is for me. Jesus says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. There's an old Roman proverb that says, money is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you are. This guy in Jesus' story has more than he needs, and that's awesome. But what could have been an opportunity for generosity and for blessing others instead became a huge stumbling block for his soul. Greed is one of the greatest obstacles to spiritual growth. A little further down in this chapter, Jesus continues in his teaching, and he says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This guy's heart was focused on himself, his own comfort, his own ease. He didn't think about the other people that he could help with what he had in excess of what he needed. He just focused on taking care of himself. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You don't get credit with God for what you leave behind. Everybody leaves the same amount, all of it. Jesus is teaching us a very simple truth. You need a plan to keep your heart and your treasure in the right place. How do you do that? How is one rich toward God, like Jesus said? The solution is generosity. God tells us to be generous, not because he wants our money. He doesn't need it. But because he doesn't want our money to have us. He knows greed is one of the greatest obstacles to our spiritual growth and vitality. And he wants to show us a better way. We talk about this at Southview because Jesus talked about it. I believe our generosity reflects how much we really trust God. Because really, what, what stops us from being generous? What stops us from generosity that we would show? Fear. Fear that there won't be enough for me. Fear that I won't have what I think I need. Generosity is a clear picture of how much we actually trust our Heavenly Father. Regular generosity is a regular reminder that it is God who is our provider, not ourselves. 
He is the God who provides. And we, we are stewards of what he puts in our hands, what he entrusts to us. God can be trusted. I've seen it over and over and over again in my own life and in the lives of other people around me. When I teach on this, I use a comparison. Try to keep it simple. Between three S givers and three P givers. I want to run through those. Three S generosity looks like this. It's spontaneous, right? It's surprise opportunities. You're not really thinking about it ahead of time. It's just spur of the moment. It's just spontaneous. Okay, yeah. Now, I didn't plan this, but okay, go. The second S is sporadic. There's no real plan. It's just here and there. And the third S is sparingly. There's no plan. There's no percentage. There's no set amount in mind. I have nothing planned in advance. And so it happens just sparingly, as it does. Many people's generosity looks like that. Not because they plan for it to, but because that's what happens when you don't have a plan. Compare that to what we call 3P generosity. 3P generosity starts with generosity being a priority. I'm going to start where I am, not where I wish I were, or not where I think I should be. If you wait till you're rich to get started being generous, you will never start. Right now is the time to be generous. Generous begins where you are. Second P is percentage. After you've made it a priority, then you say, I'm going to take a percentage of what God puts in my hands, and I'm going to be generous with it. I'm going to be generous toward His work, toward other people. Now, here's what we know. If you look at statistics, you look at research that has been done on this, the richer people are, the less they give away percentage-wise of what God has put in their hands. The percentage matters more than the amount. In Mark 12, Jesus encounters a widow and sees what she is giving and commends her. Not because of the amount. It was a very small amount. But because it was such a large percentage of what God had entrusted her with. First priority. Then percentage. And then over time, as God entrusts you with more, as he puts more in your hands, then you progressively increase that. You raise the percentage that you choose and pre-decide that you are going to be generous with. The key is to pre-decide. You choose what you are going to give, what you are going to save, and what you're going to live on. Here's what I know. Generosity isn't something you do when you have more. Generosity begins where you are now. Right now is the time to be generous. Now, please hear me. This is not about what I want or what Southview wants from you. This is about what we want for you. Your Heavenly Father does not need your money for His kingdom work. But He invites us to be a part of it. He invites us to be a part of it through the local church for our good. So that we can avoid a life characterized by greed. Where you think everything that's put in your hands is for you. To learn that it's actually for the benefit of those around you too. Here's my challenge for you. Intentionally, as we go forward in this new chapter, intentionally choose to trust God. Choose to be a person of 3P generosity. Using what God has given you to honor Him. First priority, then setting a percentage, and then progressively increasing that as he puts more in your hands, as he entrusts more to you. As a church, we are committed to be a church of irrational generosity. That's how we talk about it. A church that leads the way in giving above and beyond to advance the work of God, believing what Jesus said, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's one of our core values as a church. And over the last year, I've seen South viewers live that out like I never have before. I've watched as food pantries have been filled, as children have been cared for, as the poor have been served, as teachers, nurses, and first responders have been honored and blessed in tangible ways. I've watched as hospitals have been provided with things they need, as homeless shelters have been stockpiled with supplies, and as school supplies were collected and distributed. We have not allowed what we could not do over the last year 
to stop us from doing what we could. We've been a church characterized by irrational generosity, and we will only increase that in the days ahead. We are planning now for what that's going to look like, and I'm so excited to share that with you in the months ahead. I want you to imagine with me for just a second. I mean, what if we got this right? What if we began to allow the chains of greed and self-interest that are wrapped around all of our hearts? What if we began to be generous and those chains begin to loosen and to fall away? It would change our hearts. It would change our community. It would change our city. The face of the church would change. We would be known by our generosity. We'd be known by what we are for, not by what we're against. In the 4th century AD, the Roman emperor Julian tried to bring back paganism to defeat Christianity. But he failed. All his work to no avail. And he wrote about it in a letter. He wrote about these followers of Jesus. He said, they care for and support not only their own poor, but ours as well. It was irrational. Who would ever think of doing such a thing? The church showed no strings attached to generosity. And even those outside the church saw it and were astounded by it. Generosity is extraordinarily powerful. I challenge you to take a step here. I challenge you to take a step. Begin by making generosity toward God's work a priority in your life. An intentional choice that you pre-make. Make it a priority. And then make a percentage. Say a percentage. Start where you are, not where you wish you were or think you should be. Start where you are. Take a percentage and say, this percentage I'm going to devote to God's work. And then as God entrusts you with more and puts more in your hands, progressively increase that. Increase your generosity over time. And see what God will do through you. Here's what I know. I've watched this in my own life. I've watched it in the lives of so many around me. You cannot outgive your heavenly father. You can't do it. And as you allow generosity to flow through you more and more, you will find your heavenly father entrusting you with more and more of what he has to give you. As you guard against all kinds of greed through your intentional choice to be generous. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would intentionally choose your way. Not to to hold our fists clenched, holding tight everything we have, thinking it's all just for us. But that we would live lives of generosity, reflecting the generosity that you have shown to us. May our generosity be not something that that is just kept to us, but may those around us see it, not so that they can glorify us, but so that they can glorify you. May the church be known for irrational generosity, no strings attached, and may you be glorified because of it. We pray this together and ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.